I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guests on today's show are Paul Johnson and Paul Sonkin, seasoned value investors, longtime professors, both at Columbia Business School and Paul Johnson at Fordham as well, and co-authors of the recently released book, Pitch the Perfect Investment. I actually really enjoyed this book, and in particular, the second half. It's written with a young analyst as the target audience and describes in very clear language what's required to research the perfect investment idea. And then separately, how an analyst can understand a portfolio manager's thought process to effectively communicate the idea and then get it adopted in a portfolio. Despite that kind of target audience, I think just about every portfolio manager can benefit uh, from the frameworks in the book and will help them more clearly communicate with their team. And I also suspect allocators will find yet another angle to use in questioning managers. Our conversation covers the concept of the book, the notion of the wisdom of crowds, gaining an edge, the four questions every portfolio manager needs to answer before they'll put an idea in their portfolio, and the role of creativity in investing. These gifted professors offer clear terminology for investment first principles, and along the way gave me a renewed appreciation for how difficult it is to beat the markets. Now, I have to apologize in advance. The quality of sound in this recording isn't quite as good as, as pretty much all of my other episodes. Somehow from my office in Midtown Manhattan, we managed to pick up a radio signal in the background. My producer, Matt, did a great job cleaning it up, but it's not ideal. Fortunately, this one's well worth grinding through. And this week, in the spirit of the Thanksgiving season, I want to offer you my thanks for your kind words, great emails, and iTunes reviews about the show. Please do keep spreading the word to your friends. And without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Paul Johnson and Paul Sonkin. Paul, Paul, this is the first show I've done with two people, let alone two named Paul. <laughs> I like that. Why don't we start with talking about how this book came about in the first place? The timing's great. At the end of October, four years ago, Paul and I were in, attending the Graham and Doddsville Breakfast, the annual event hosted by the Columbia Business School. And afterwards, I asked him about the, what's going on, what's new, just catching up. And he said, ah, oh, I finally bit the bullet and I'm going to write a book. And I thought, oh, great. I don't have the energy or the time to do it, so <laughs> I think it's great. I said, what is the name of your book? And he said, The Perfect Pitch. And I laughed. And he said, why are you laughing? Thinking I was laughing at the title. And I said, oh, because I've always wanted to write a book. And the book I was going to write is called The Perfect Investment. And he laughed back and he said, wow, how funny. We've known each of this all this time. We have somewhat similar investment strategies. He was a former student. <laughs> we taught together. Probably not surprising that we came up with similar so we started emailing each other that day, and we quickly realized we were writing exactly the same book from different sides. And what Paul would say then, and at the time I didn't appreciate it, is that the pitch is the architecture of the recommendation. The investment recommendation is the pitch. If you can't get the pitch across, you can't convince somebody to buy it, you haven't done the requisite work. And when I first heard that, I was like, that makes no sense to me, because I thought all you have to do is do the research, and the pitch will take care of itself. By the end of the day, really probably into the next week, we had agreed to collaborate, despite my sense I didn't want to write a book. And the name of the book became Pitch the Perfect Investment. And this was before the movie Pitch Perfect came out, so it didn't have the... About the same time, my daughter asked me, she said, what's the name of your book? And I told her, and she said, wait a minute, there's a movie. <laughs> I've seen the movie a couple of times. And so that's what really launched it. And it, the second story is actually better than the first. I think the first is better. They're both pretty good. And there's a third one coming out. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm hoping we get some play on it. But it really, the story at the beginning tells the story of the book. Because it took me probably a year until I fully appreciated what Paul had been saying from the beginning. And now I'm a complete convert, which is that unless you can pitch this stock, get the portfolio manager to not only buy it, but then scale the position. It, it just doesn't matter. It's the proverbial tree in the woods. And so we, we, even though the first part of the book is really oriented towards finding the perfect investment, if you will, 
the end is pitch the perfect image, but how you pitch that. And it becomes the conclusion of all the work you've done. So what happened is that we were originally going to write the book for practitioners, but it we felt as though we could make a much bigger impact choosing a different demographic. And most of the schools, they assign like the, the intelligent investor and common stocks and uncommon profits. So we really very deliberately chose that dem- demographic. And then we thought, okay, what do they need to learn? And w- what our intention was, was just kind of to outsource all of the stuff on discounted cash flow. And then when we started looking around, we thought, like, there's nothing that's really, it's too complicated. So we decided to include that basic stuff. And the book, the whole book kind of builds upon itself up to a crescendo. So that was kind of how it evolved. And then the way that we set it up is that you have to come up with an intrinsic value. And then you have to understand price formation and how the market came to the price that it came to. And then adding value through research and understanding risk. And then once you get all that, then you have to pitch it. So what we've always thought is that first you have to convince yourself on an idea and then you have to convince someone else. And those require two very different skills. When Paul and I started writing this, we'd both been teaching forever at Columbia. And we thought literally you could write the book a couple hours a week for a year, we'd be done. And at the end of a year, we realized we didn't know what we were talking about. And it wasn't that we didn't know because we hadn't been doing it. We realized that we were like a lot of people and we threw terms around without necessarily defining them in a way that made sense and was consistent. People throw around risk as if everyone understands. Competitive advantage is that everybody understands it. We use Michael Steinhardt's variant perception as a very important cornerstone of thinking about how you get an edge in the market. And it was clear that his language is somewhat convoluted. The guy's brilliant, but his language is a little convoluted. And we spent months just trying to tease that out until we did. The first part of the book, you're really describing a lot of basics, almost like a textbook of what are cash flows and what's competitive analysis. A lot of it is sort of how do you think about a business and how do you value the business? There are a couple of things you talk about that were just really crystal clear. Like, so one of them, we could talk a little bit about the wisdom of crowds and how you think about that in the context of an investment. The first part of the book is about intrinsic value, the first section. The second section is about how price gets set. And I had been, we both been involved in the wisdom of the crowds forever. We thought that this was a great mechanism to, to really get practitioners and market efficient academics to understand where that collides. And at the limit, the market may be efficient, and at times it has behavioral aspects. And the more we played with wisdom of the crowds, the more we realized that it was an incredibly rich metaphor. We leveraged certainly the stuff that Scott Page has done out in the University of Michigan. I was involved in helping Sawicki kind of get his, which became his book. So we leveraged all of that. And back and forth, because of this process, we ended up with six factors. And once we got it, so many things fell into place. And Fama's market efficiency maps perfectly. And Schiller, Kahneman, Tversky, and Thaler's behavioral fits perfectly into this. And the more we played with it, it was like those chapters just snapped. So can we map through those six factors? Oh, absolutely. It ends up that if you're looking at wisdom of crowds from Fama's perspective, it really is about information, processing, and then trading. If you look at it from the behavioral side, they're trying to see it. What they really do is they want to see where individual behavioral finance errors, biases bubble up to the collective. And we ended up with the six, which essentially are the first two are information. So one is it has to be disseminated, it has to be available. And the second is it has to be observed. And it ends up both are important. Maybe what we should do is take a step back. Fama says that an efficient stock is one where the market incorporates all available information. So there were kind of three major parts of that, that the information has to be properly disseminated. And then the second is that it has to be processed without any systematic bias. And then the third is that it has to be incorporated into the stock price. So that became condition one and two of the six. Information has to be available and it has to be observed by a sufficient number of people. Then the information has to be processed without any systematic bias. And what that involves is the diversity of the shareholder base and then the independence of the shareholder base. So if either of those two break down, 
then you have a systematic bias. And that's two of the three areas where behavioral finance really enters into the equation. Then it has to be expressed in the stock price. And things that could prevent it from the information get, getting to the stock price, it could be that people are, are unwilling or unable to trade. So in terms of unwilling, it's when you get a case like 2009, where people like deer in headlights and they're afraid to put capital to work. So they know it's cheap, but they are afraid of putting capital at risk. So again, that's the third area where behavioral finance comes in. Or can come in. Can come in, yeah. or they're unable to trade. And what that could be because this, the stock is a micro cap and it's too ill liquid. So if you don't have a sufficient number of people that can express their opinions, then you wind up with a missed stock price. Now, we have this other side, which we'll call Schiller, Baylor, Kahneman, and Tversky, that says, oh, but humans are irrational, they don't do that. So Paul and I, we said, well, wait a minute, that's got to fit. We can't have a model where that doesn't fit. And it's that middle piece, the processing piece, that really Sawicki and Page and Mobison and his work have always lumped independence and diversity together. And we were just like, they're completely different issues. So diversity is, it's almost easier to talk about lack of diversity. Lack of diversity is when everyone's thinking the same way. Well, that's a bubble or a panic. Everybody's thinking the same way. We've lost diversity. Independence is slightly different where people are diverse, but when they go to express their opinion, then they're collectively influenced by some external. Can so a good example would be like Herbalife stock when Bill Ackman did his presentation. So people had, you might have had diversity in the shareholder base and that people had a lot of different estimates in terms of what, what, what it was worth. And then what they did is they set aside their their estimate and adopted Ackman's view and sold the stock. Obviously, everybody didn't think that because otherwise the stock would have gone to zero, but it had a big move in the stock. So that's really the lack of independence where they adopt someone else's view and cast away their, their own view. Diversity is kind of different because that's where everyone is thinking the same way independently. So one example that we've kind of been toying around with is, is, is like, imagine if you asked a thousand portfolio managers what Amazon was worth. You might get a number of like $600. Now, if you said to them, okay, are you willing to put money on that? Are you willing to either buy the stock or short the stock? There are a lot of people that they aren't willing to short the stock because of the risk. So the only people in the market are the ones that think it's worth north of $1,000. So you really, you don't have diversity in the shareholder base because half of the people or More than. whatever but there's a whole aren't segment participating. That's, that's not participating. And so you end up with effectively a not very diverse audience. Now, one of the things we talked about, we didn't put as much in the book, one of the many places we're like, oh, if we'd had one more paragraph, is just because you lack diversity or independence doesn't mean they're wrong. And there's a subtlety there that's not insignificant. So we're not saying that Amazon is mispriced. We're just saying the crowd's not very diverse. So if an event happens that challenges the crowd's view, this stock's going to move hard and violently. And we see that in growth stocks all the time. If the growth breaks, there's nobody there on the other side kind of balancing. You don't have a diverse group. All of a sudden, everybody that owns it owns it for the growth. The growth is no longer there. They exit. The next trade has to be somebody who sees value but at a much lower price. So how do you layer in quants to this? Because almost by definition, the way we're talking about Amazon is, is segmented portfolio managers, some of whom have similar views about pricing over 1,000. Others have different views but don't want to play. Almost by definition, index funds and quants probably look at things differently. Well, we actually, we, I, I forget where in the book it is, but we talk about the quant crisis of August of 07 as a perfect example when you don't have diversity in the share, shareholder base. And that was what really caused it is that you had so many quants that were using the same models, so there wasn't a lot of diversity. And they dominated trading. And they dominated trading. And then when some... Uh, you know, you don't really need a lot to set the ball rolling. And then that lack of diversity, when it had to be unwound, just created incredibly large price moves. 
the other, you added one other question. So that's sort of a quant piece. They have their own models. And if you had a diversity of quants, then they would have some diversity. I think the second piece is this index passive. And they're a price taker. They're not setting price. Quants, there's some new evolution of being price setters. But index funds, by definition, are price takers. And what we don't fully know is what happens if we ever have a bear market and index funds have to sell. They've been collecting assets, enormous amount of assets for 20 years. When the Wells Fargo news came out last summer, all of the corporate stuff, there were a lot of people that felt that stock didn't go down as much as it would because the index funds were all piling in and waiting and the waiting didn't shift enough. I don't know if that's the case, but it's clearly kind of an overlay. What we've not done is test them where a company, big, high-flying company, misses, it gets repriced, what happens to the index funds? We just don't know. We can speculate, but we don't know. But that's a perfect example of kind of things that we encountered in the book is just people throw these terms around and they lump it all together and they, they don't understand what they're actually talking about. You know, one of my favorite ones for years and years, and I imagine just about everybody listening to this, has come across the term edge. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a <laughs> funny is, story. Yeah, it went from a noun to a verb or whatever, whatever it is. And so few people define, let's just call it a competitive advantage or whatever you think your advantage is in doing research on a name. Um, I loved that you guys define it in the book. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that definition is? If you have an efficient market, then price equals value. And because determining value independently requires time and energy, there's a cost to it. Right? So you sort of go from first principles and you realize... That if price equals value, there's no reason to do fundamental research. Go by the index fund, I guess, is the, the conclusion. For a stock to be mispriced, price does not equal value. It has to have one of the conditions of the wisdom crowd has to be violated. That's simple, right? So once you invert it. And once we did that, we had our list. So an edge is either I know something the market doesn't know. That's that information. I have figured something out. What we say in the book, I see something the market doesn't see. Or I have a trading advantage, which is either I'm willing to trade or I have access to a trade that can't. And that's it. I mean, the good news is we defined it. The bad news is the list is short. And so we really, when we say edge, pure informational edge is really hard to get. Pure analytical edge generally comes with a lot of experience. You've been doing it a long time. You're like, you see something. Uh, there's great examples. We talk about Michael Price when he reads the paper. He does this great exercise. He has so much experience and so many different schemas, we call them, that they, they trigger, little pieces of information trigger in his mind a whole thought. He sees stuff that I don't see as an investor. And then the third one is this ability to trade. So the edge at the end of the day is one of those three. Now we think that... And there's no fourth. Yeah, there's no fourth. So your edge is information on analytical or trading. But we really think in the real world what happens is this, you either get a piece of information that triggers a schema in your mind, that you now start to think differently than the crowd, which then leads to different questions and different research processes. You go get other information, and before you know it, you've combined information which is not really unavailable necessarily, but you've framed it in a way, and it's that cycle of a different view, different questions, putting the information into a different puzzle. We use puzzle a lot in the book, that you end up with this aha moment of, wait a minute, this is really X versus Y. In, in, in the book, we talk about Judge Mansfield's decision in the Elkin uh, v. Liggett and Myers case. And basically what he says there is that it's totally okay. And the job of an analyst is that you're getting non-material, non-public Im information. You're mixing it together with the information that's already there in the public and your own knowledge and experience which is your analytical process, and then you're arriving at a conclusion which is material, non-public, but legal. And it's not based on material, non-public information. Well, well it, it, it is you're drawing a conclusion which is material, non-public, but you didn't get it through any illegal means. Right. Now, both of you guys participate in smaller cap stocks all the yes. way down. Yeah. Do you find the ability to get an edge is, in theory, there are fewer people looking, people don't want to spend the time and resources and names they can't scale. Do you find in practice that it's easier? No. Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> sort of. 
Ten this years is, ago, it was a hell yeah, of a lot I think, easier. I think the part, I want to come back to Elizabeth Crowns for a moment, and one, the one nice part about writing this book, well, writing the book with Paul was an awesome experience. There were there was at least a dozen times where I literally wanted to get into a, a Uber and come up to his house and beat him within one inch of his life. Other than those moments, it was really a fantastic experience. The net result of which is that the clarity in my mind, the clarity in his mind, is so much higher, and our vocabulary is so much tighter that now when we talk about things, we just get through them very quickly. So... Go back to your question. I'm going to use the tools. The sad part about wisdom of the crowds is, we figured out, is you don't need as many people as you think to get a wise crowd. We, you think you'd have to have all these really smart, sophisticated people. Ends up, you don't. The robust, we call it a robust consensus, starts to emerge so quickly that you need a couple of people that are smart and highly motivated. And before you know it, it starts to bubble up. Now back to your question. I'm with Paul 10 years ago. I'd probably even say 15 years ago. It was great because there were a lot of retail, a lot of unsophisticated, and we could come into a good situation and really exploit it. You call the CEO and he says, oh, you're the first person I've talked to in a year, and you know, it sort of warms your heart. It's probably, it's probably confirmation bias, but it always warms your heart. You know, now, the, the internet and conferences and online and webcasts and all this stuff, the information is so much more available that I certainly think it's harder than it ever was. I think it's, the, it, the market has gotten a lot more efficient, and it's really been driven by the cost of computers and data, data processing has gone down enormously. And the fact that hedge funds have gotten a lot bigger, and you know, you go to a twenty billion dollar hedge fund that gets one percent management fees, so that's two hundred million just for turning them on the lights. So they have a lot of money to spend on resources. So you have like natural language processing al algorithms going through all sorts of SEC filings. Now, that's not quantitative. But it's computer assisted it's, for it's, sure. It's, it's computer assisted or like you have, uh, you know, ex-CIA operatives that are listening to conference calls and opining on the voice stress of the people talking. So And, all, and, and of course, you have the GLGs and then you have GLG part twos. And, and then the number of companies, you have the listings gap. So the companies in 1996, there were 8,000 companies on organized U.S. exchanges, which doesn't include the pink sheets and the OTC bulletin board. And that is 4,000 companies now, even though on our levels of GDP, it should be 10,000. So you have more money, more intelligent people using a hell of a lot of technology chasing half the number of stocks. So on top of the challenges, which is now more competitive, <laughs> and at least we've gotten through defining very clearly sort of what it takes to assess a company, assess the competitive environment, what information you have, how that's different from what the market thinks. We now have a communication challenge. Oh, for sure. Which is a team of people needs to figure out of the information they have, of the edge they have, how does that go from, say, the analyst to the portfolio manager such that it works its way into the portfolio and is sized the right way? And so this is where we get into the pitch. So what we did is we said, again, reverse engineered. We talked to every portfolio manager we knew. We both were portfolio managers. We kept saying, what makes you buy a stock? What makes you buy a stock? What makes you buy a stock? And we realized there were three components. One is this selection process, which is the schema. Come back to it. The second one is the content of the pitch, which relates to the rest of the book, right? You can almost see the edges or wait. You say, oh, i got to present the edges and why the market's wrong. And then the fourth piece was the delivery, which is probably oriented, we originally oriented towards uh, our, our, our primary cohort, which is a business school MBA student. But it, in reality, what yeah, we're finding the, out is... The way that we thought about it is that the security selection is the first piece of the puzzle. So if I'm a domestic my, microcap equity manager and you're pitching me Polish sovereign debt, it's not going to fit my schema. So it just kind of stops there. Then the second thing is the content of the message. So now you've selected the security, you've done your research, you've come up with the idea, but then you have to structure that content in order for the portfolio manager to take it in most as, as efficiently as possible. Then what we thought is, okay, so you have a pitch that's written down on a piece of paper, and the example that we talk about in the book is like you have Warren Buffett read the words on that piece of paper, and then you have my son Zev read those words on a piece of paper. Who are you going to believe? And they're saying the exact same thing. And then we started thinking about the differences 
which is the delivery of the message. So back to the schema. The schema is every portfolio manager has a schema. Even if you've been in the business for five minutes, you're starting to develop your schema. Maybe you got it from business school or reading a book or you want to in, in, imitate somebody big. You get to somebody like Mario or Seth or Buffett, they have these incredibly nuanced schemas that they're looking for. Leon Kuberman recently was quoted in, a, in the Grandma Dodgeville newsletter a couple of years ago, and then I saw him speak last year. He said the same thing. He uses a beer analogy. He uses it in a lot of his presentations. And what he's essentially describing is his schema. What we found out is schemas are multi-layered. And there's what we'll call the stated schema. Where it's, I only buy domestic. Uh, Tom Russo's, right? I want to buy global, consumer, family-oriented. He, that's all stated. And then behind that is this list of things that he may state, but I have no idea what they necessarily mean. I want a certain governance structure. Well, I know what governance structures are. I don't know what Tom Russo means by his governance structure. So there's an example of a statement that makes sense. Oh, yeah, of course, governance would be important, particularly in family-controlled businesses. Beyond that, he has this incredibly nuanced set of, I want them known enough, but not so much. It's different in Germany than it is in South America, right? These are all of his experiences. And so I go pitch him a stock, and I say, it's global consumer, all this stuff. And he, within a minute or two, he says, ah, I can never buy it because of the way the family owns that. And I'd be like, what? And it's, it's 30 years of looking at this. He has this incredibly nuanced schema that I don't know. It would be hard for him to articulate all of it because he doesn't necessarily know. He can show examples where it doesn't fit. But like anything in life, we'd have to see a, as many examples as he has to replicate it. So that first part of it is the scheme, and it ends up that the scheme is shockingly important. And it's important, really, as we continue to play with it, is you're not going to get the portfolio manager to listen unless you match the stated schema. Well, I guess what we say is that there's objective criteria and subjective criteria. So the objective criteria, it's pretty easy to nail down. And, and that stuff like the market cap, domestic, what... In industry they're in. Profitability, and, P yeah, ratio, whatever it is. Yeah. So those are things that you can reduce to numbers or, or it's yes or no. And if the analyst doesn't meet that set of criteria, he should be dragged out in the street and shot like a dog. Now, the subjective criteria... Well, in South America, they oh, actually, drag right, things right. into the street. Different, different or they drag people out <laughs> into scheme. the street, and they shoot them like dogs. <laughs> actually, you don't have to actually shoot dogs in order to drag someone out into the street and shoot them like a dog. So, that's true. But All that's right. neither right. here nor there. So then you have the subjective criteria, which is like, I want a company with good capital allocation. So I Sounds hate, great, right? I hate companies that pay dividends. So if... If you pitch a company to me and they pay dividends, I'm not going to consider that to be good capital allocation or, or a strong competitive position. It's very, very subjective. It sounds good, right? It's a, a declarative statement. I only want managed, good management teams. What in the world does that mean? Now, if you can hit the objective criteria, then you'll get the portfolio manager to listen. If you hit the subjective criteria, then the portfolio manager will buy by the idea, get it into the portfolio, take take a tracking position. But getting back to your question in terms of this communication with the analyst and the portfolio manager, the third piece, which we we couldn't get everything into the book, and this is something that didn't make it into the book. And a bit more for practitioners yeah, than, it's, than it our is audience. Definitely, is that in order to get the portfolio manager to actually scale the position, there has to be a transfer of ownership from the analyst to the portfolio manager. And the problem that you have is that there's a lot of subconscious emotions going on in the portfolio manager's head and in the analyst's head. So the portfolio manager is like, I can't scale the position up unless I feel as though it's my idea. So I have to do the research. I have to internalize it. But the analyst is holding on for dear life and is very territorial because they're afraid that if they give up ownership of the idea that they won't be ad adequately compensated. And we feel as though that is a tension within a lot of very well-functioning or organizations. And the irony is we, we meet people all the time. We, we both have a very large alumni of former students. We talk to the analysts, and it's shocking how often the analysts will say, I, I did some work, three days to three weeks. I went in, and the portfolio manager kicked the idea out in 40 seconds. I saw him in the hall. I pitched it objective criteria, they said, I'd love to hear it come to my office. Within a minute, they're like, no, subjective criteria. And, and that's the thing is that we didn't make this stuff up, like sitting in a room contemplating our navel. Like 
we have taught, well, Paul's taught o- over 2,000 students. I think I've taught about 450 over the 16 years that, that I taught. And I taught for 16 years, and I haven't taught in four years. So I have some students that have been out for 20 years. And I keep in contact with it's a lot of students. It's just amazing to us, that piece, the objective subjective. And then we hear from portfolio managers, former students, colleagues, friends. They say, the line I hear over and over, I don't know why we employ analysts. They never bring me an idea. But they do bring you ideas. They just don't hitting that subjective criteria. So then you think, like, why is there all this frustration? And that was really what we set to find out. And, and to- that got into the book. And then the new piece, which we're talking now as we go out to practitioners, say, look, the book is aimed here, but there's a lot of, I like to say, off-label use, is now if you don't do this ownership, co-ownership and it's not just co-ownership but the portfolio manager has to internalize the idea they won't scale it otherwise oh give them your line yeah no i think it's like a well-functioning marriage where both partners do 90 percent of the work and claim 48 right that's how you get it to work and (laughs) and the portfolio manager takes ownership but i expect you as an analyst to be working just as hard as you always have if something happens i want i want to be the first call and i don't think very few organizations that we've been exposed to have thought about the objective subjective and then this well but let's just repeat that because it's such an important point so in order to have an optimally functioning relationship between the analyst and the portfolio manager each of them have to do 90% of the work and take 48% of the credit and it's just, on an idea given the egos in wall street i i can see why that we've ended up where we've ended up so when somebody comes in with an idea, presumably they've met the objective criteria, they're feeling out, and over time they learn more and more about the subjective criteria. I like the way you frame that. What is it that the portfolio manager wants to know? Every PM asks the same four questions. Now, the thing we've really learned is there's a lot of different vocabulary in the business. But when we go and we press people, they say, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. So the four questions are simply how much can I make? What is the upside? Why are we talking about this? Why are we spending time? Almost every portfolio manager, once they get kind of comfortable with that, they're instantly going to say, but what's the risk? Where can this go wrong? Where are the estimates? What's the confidence we have in it? Then the third question, which we really realize is kind of two questions, is number one is, how did the market get it wrong? Why is there a mispricing? And the second piece, part B, is how did you figure it out? Now, you know, it's very important that both of those get answered because you come and say the market's wrong and I've been doing this for two years or three years and I figured it out versus the crowd. And then the fourth one is, how is the next guy going to figure it out? That's a catalyst essentially, although that's a word that's controversial as well. It's really how is the mispricing going to be corrected? And we tie all this back. Now, we think if you only get a shot, one question, PM, you're going to only get their attention for a minute. We think the third question is really the most important how did the market get it wrong? And how did you figure it out? The other questions sort of answer themselves. So if I come in and say the market is, mis- the stock's mispriced, the market doesn't understand X, and this is how I figured it out, you, you sort of argue the upside becomes a bit more obvious. The risk becomes you're wrong in your convention, and how the next guy can figure it out, how the market's going to correct, kind of is all bundled. So that's what we think. Yeah, so we, I, I guess we really think that where most people screw it up is they don't fully articulate why the stock is mispriced and a portfolio manager subconsciously unless they feel as though they fully understand that they're not going to buy the stock and if you think about it if you can explain why the stock is mispriced and why your view is different you're articulating what your edge is and it comes back to information analytical or trading and that combination and that's your pitch and so if I only have a moment with a portfolio manager and I think that it fits their criteria, I want to focus exactly what Paul said. This is what's wrong. This is how I figured it out. This is our edge, information analytical piece. This is what we know. These are the conjectures. And everything else, I think, falls into place. So in the conversations you've had with portfolio managers, analysts along the way, how much of what gets presented is also tied to charisma? And the view of the portfolio manager of how smart is that analyst, how much do I like them, how much do they present, the whole notion that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. There are three factors that they look at, which is... They being the portfolio manager. Anybody really, but in this case, the portfolio manager. Is the credibility, the capability, 
and the likability of the analyst of the analyst okay, the credibility yeah so capability the capability like. is like is this person smart could they have have, they have the right skill out? set do they have the right skill set the credibility is do i trust them do did i they trust do the what they're saying did do, they do the did work did they do the work and then the likability it kind of influences the other two which is do i like them or not and that's where you kind of get into this charisma because if you think about it if you like someone you're going to be you're going to accept what they're telling you more than if you don't like someone you know you just you trust people that you like and you don't trust people you don't like we were very careful in the book cuz we we and we argued this a lot is we want to be it, we didn't want to say to people that were genetically disadvantaged you know, not tall, 6'2", went to an Ivy League school. We didn't want to tell them, hey, there's no chance. Because I don't think that's true. There are a lot of biases. That's why we think the book is powerful. Focus on the edge. Focus on the four questions. Focus on doing the job. Well, and what we and said in the book is that you want to minimize extraneous factors, as much as you which can, could but. be distracting. Well, it's kind of interesting in the, if you think about the construction of teams, right? There's plenty of research that shows diversity of opinions, diversity of backgrounds. It's, is a it's cognitive thing. diversity cognitive is what diversity. they're talking about. At the same time, without being fully conscious of it, any of us has the tendency to gravitate towards liking people that are like us. Everyone has that tendency, and that's not some tension. of us. And, and as Paul said, we're, this is one of our many pet peeves or clarity we got is it's diversity, it's, it's two things. You need this cognitive diversity that's appropriate to the situation. And what you really need is some level of expertise. What we've been working on recently, Paul's really been driving, is this notion of how creativity plays. And it ends up that creativity is shockingly important in security analysis and investing, more so than any of the literature we've seen in the discipline, not away from the discipline. And a variant perspective is nothing more than a creative view of the world. It's novel, it's different, it's non-consensus. And what you start to say is creativity is skill and environment. There's lots of factors that go into it. We think the future of this team-based is, guess what? Diversity, cognitive diversity, which may have other aspects of diversity, uh, creating an environment where people can be wrong and the, the way you want it the litmus test for whether you have a creative organization is what do you do with people that are wrong because creativity is different a lot of it's going to be wrong well if you take people that are wrong and i guess we our analogy for the podcast is take them out in the street and shoot them then you're going to get no creativity if you are the the best dumb idea of the week gets free lunch on friday you're gonna have an enormous amount of creativity and you want to try to balance those two we almost all two things happen is we get attracted to people we like and this notion of we the team looks alike second thing that happens is because of the organizational structures people start to think alike because they like ah boss likes x i'm doing more of x and less of y by every time i can bring up y which i think is creative forces the group to go outside its edge but creates a new angle boss gets upset yells at me embarrasses the person so you have the skills you want to recruit for and then you have to create the environment where you nurture that and and wall street's been driven by alpha males with add and they got to grow and learn or the next teams i think are going to develop that way the definition of creativity the formal definition in cognitive science is something which is novel and that has value so if you think about a variant perspective that is a view that is different from the consensus, which is something novel, and then you have to be right, so it has value. Now, so then when you look that generating alpha, it's being creative, it's creativity. Now, what that allows you to do is it allows you to leverage off of like 90 years of research that's been done on creativity. But I'm scratching my head why Wall Street hasn't become aware of that because they've been studying this for a very long time. Now, you talk to the creativity guys like Anders Ericsson or Dean Simonton. They haven't done any work on people on Wall Street, and they haven't heard of anybody that has done work of people on Wall Street. So what you look is like the creativity guys don't know anything about Wall Street, and the Wall Street guys don't know anything about creativity. And in an increasingly efficient market... You need it. The stuff on Wisdom of the Crowds, else. if you then apply that Wisdom of the Crowds and say that's how the market works, and we, that's the group we have to be. 
I would rather join them than, than not. And so what I want is a team of cognitive diversity as much as possible. I want creative people. I want an environment that encourages that creativity. And we're always crazy. You know, Dahlia's idea of meritocracy is exactly the same thing. He's done it from a somewhat different angle. But the idea, I want people to feel comfortable putting out crazy ideas. Now, the punchline with the creativity stuff, and I won't take long on this, is that the people that are the most creative, if you look at, again, this 90 years of lit literature, they tend to uh, many times above the population. They have mood disorders, depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorder, Asperger's, o OCD. Asperger's, when Asperger wrote his stuff in the 40s, he was looking at these highly intelligent kids that weren't socially with it, and he called them his little professors. So Asperger's was a label for people that were very smart and just a little so socially awkward. Now, how many portfolio managers do you know on Wall Street that are... Descriptively like that? And yeah. yet now, let's take it one more step. Let's take this to your credibility question a moment ago. If I want creativity, I want novel, new, different, non-consensus, and yet I'm really attracted to the convention, 6'2", alpha male, Ivy League, I'm... I'm attracted to this, and yet the portfolio manager has none of those skills. So in the interview process... Or not the skills, no, those I mean, not, traits. None of those traits that he's putting up, he or she's putting up as who they're attracted to. Because they to. don't interview particularly well. They're a little socially awkward. So you can imagine the interview process. You've got somebody who is awkward and difficult and no eye contact. And they work out in the meeting, they say, ah, he didn't, I, I'm not going to hire anybody with no eye contact. No, no, no. <laughs> it, the whole process is, if that's your goal, the process is somewhat messed up. We so think, I, anyway. I couldn't help reading the book and starting to interpret it through the lens of an allocator. Ah, yeah. Yep, right. Yep. So how this can you yep. <laughs> how can you take these frameworks and apply them to the portfolio managers you're interviewing? So I'll can you guys well, for starters, yeah. if someone generating it. alpha is creative, you want to look for people that are quirky. You know, her, like like a Michael Burry yeah, has you know Aspergers or ought to, what whatever it he's is on the so spectrum, yeah. so it it becomes like a little counterintuitive but we think the trouble with the allocators is that a lot of allocators they have a checklist whether it's a mental checklist or a, a checklist that's written out and whether it's formal or not formal which is a schema by the way which is a schema now but that isn't good enough because if you say okay if they fit this criteria will you will you uh, allocate stated, capital stated to, criteria. to them <laughs> yeah so that's your objective, <laughs> that's <an> objective. criteria <laughs> exactly so then they'll say and and i was talking to to like you know one of the legends budge collins and he says, like, I got to get to know them. I got to get to, like, really know their process after spending a lot of time with them and knowing them for, that's for a That's the long ownership piece. <laughs> so that's kind of the subjective. And it's that criteria that they can't really articulate. Now, if you can't articulate it and if you say, well, I just get a feeling or I just know it, I think that that means that you just really haven't defined it. So what we're working on... And some on, of that is probably good and some of that may be biased. Meaning that yeah. you may just have a bias. I like people that went to Ivy League schools. And you don't want to state it or you, you haven't fully recognized it. It's a bias. Other of it can be experience. Yeah, so we're working on a different set of criteria to kind of augment what allocators already have that we think will be a lot more But we effective. do think it's as simple as the, the, the whoever the you're potentially giving capital to. They've got to be able to explain their process in a way that makes sense. This is where we get our Well, they have to explain, yeah, where, where they have an edge. Is and, it and information, Then there has to be a analytical? consistency of the edge. The edge has to be consistent with their strategy, has to scale as the strategy, as they take on more. You know, all the stuff you would normally ask, we think we just add this piece to it, which is, all right, here's your edge. There were a lot of guys that were great at $500 million and not very good at $5 billion. Now, market's gotten tougher, but that, I think, is... Using the book. So we, we think there's some off-label capabilities. The other problem that we kind of see with allocators is that they're looking, well, and you can opine on this more than I can, is that they're looking for specialization. And if you look at the people that have really outperformed over long periods of time, 
they haven't had as much specialization as you would think. So if you look at like one of the greats, like my hero, Seth Klarman, so he has a very nuanced, structured schema about mispricing. About mispriced securities. He doesn't care what they are. But he doesn't care what they are. So he just kind of takes that schema and then looks to different asset classes. But it's very, very flexible and And rare. He, yeah. Or 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 Jeff Hallis is is the same way. Or a lot of these guys that have put up these phenomenal returns that I have incredible amounts of respect for. They're very, very disciplined, but they have more open charters. You know, one of the things that I've always found incredibly tricky is that value investing lends itself to the clear articulation of schemas, of idea generation, of discussion within a team. And yet, there are a lot of people you could talk to in, particularly in different styles of investing, even if it's outside of equities, that seem incredibly knowledgeable and don't have great results. Or they don't come across as extremely knowledgeable, but they have spectacular results. Oh, I, we think we can explain everything in the book. Yeah. We can explain everything in the book, right? I think you can better articulate the mispricings and the catalysts and things of that nature. You know, you can explain it a lot easier. Like, okay, the intrinsic value is $10, and it's trading at $5, and this is why it's trading at $5, and this is what's going to have to happen for it to trade back up to 10 But I think it morphs. I, I'm an ex, I, I was a growth guy for a long time before I became a value guy. I teach value investing at Columbia Business School. I teach a great segment on growth investing because I think it applies perfectly. And growth investing is nothing more. It's that third component of, of cash flow, if you will. You could argue the fourth one, but third or fourth one you have to consider the stocks can be mispriced because guess what? The growth is going to be higher or longer than the market thinks. Well, and value investors, they're not anti-growth. They're anti-paying for growth. Right. So you don't want to overpay for the growth, and growth is the trickiest thing to value. I think that's the tension. You then talked about two different groups. The group, the, the one that's easy is people with great performance and can't articulate it. They have great schemas. I mean, they're disciplined. They have great schemas. Not necessarily articulate. Though You want those. There are idiots and wants to some degree. Well, chances are those are the people with the Asperger's yeah, right. and, and the ADD. And the allocators aren't good with that because they don't interview well and they don't like it. And I couldn't get the process and I didn't like his compliance mm -hmm. rules, blah, blah, blah. And yet year in and year out, they seem to put up the Well, numbers. think about Michael Jordan, like asking, well, you could, uh, you know, if you say like, how do you dunk so, I'm, I'm not a sports guy, but like, how, how do you get yeah, so yeah, many interview baskets? Michael and just say, how do you do that little thing where you take off at the half court line? Right? And he describes it and you're like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Well, we can just do it. The group yeah, he says, I just run really fast, jump really high, and sink right. it in the halfway basket. Through, right, halfway through, you spin the ball. You know, the, other, the other group we talked about that sound great or really smart, but don't have great performance. Market's hard. Second is, you know, it is about that edge. I was attracted to small cap stocks because there were fewer people, at least when I started, there were fewer people there. Nothing more. It wasn't like I woke up and said, oh, I like small cap. I'd rather done big cap, better liquidity, access to trades, all that. But that's why I did micro cap because I don't want to compete. Right. That's what we did. And, and so that was, I knew where my edge, my edge was just that. And we made a lot of people in the business really smart, really talented and terrible numbers. But I think they just fun. Some of my former friends that are engineers make terrible investors. Not all engineers make, but my friends that were former engineers, because they kept thinking it's an engineering problem. I said, no, it's a, I mean, it is potentially an engineering problem, but there's one more piece. Everybody else, and unless you have a sense of what's going on in the crowd, you can't. Well, the other guess problem the that problem. you have is, is that these people that are incredibly articulate but don't have very good performance is that so every single day, people are starting new funds. So every, every month of every year, people are starting new funds. So if you start your fund in June of 09, and... You've had good numbers. You know, and, <laughs> and then again, there have been people that started in... in June of 08. You know, June of 08, June of 07. There are people that started in June of two, two, 2010. So a certain amount of those people are going to do really, really well. So you're and saying luck have, matters. <laughs> yes. You'll have a good three-year track record, and then you'll be able to generate, you know, you'll be able to attract a lot of capital, and then you'll have good five-year numbers and good seven-year numbers, and then oh, all of a sudden the market will change. You'll get wiped out. And then 
a new crop you, of people will come up. Right, with new schemas. You know, Buffett says it. I don't think anybody would challenge that Buffett has put up the numbers and he's incredibly talented. But he, you know, he puts it in a slightly different perspective. We were joking about this last week is if he had born 100 years earlier. Well, he says himself, if I were born like in the Stone Age, like he, he'd be running away from lions saying, but I can allocate capital. I can allocate capital. Like it's very dependent environment on your matters. environment. And in the creativity literature, again, they talk about the fact that a big factor in creativity is the current context. So it's like people on Wall Street are trying to figure it out. Okay, so now you guys have penned this book with great clarity that describes the investment process. And it's awfully hard not to read it and go, wow, it is really hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to get all this information you need about what the market thinks, all this information that's additional, have an edge, and then communicate it well. If you were starting over today... You're out of college, you're out of business school, you've done four or five years, maybe you've had business. an idea in the this portfolio. This is like a layup question. Are you in the business or are you going I gave to technology? This lecture, we give, it's SUNY we give, Albany. We give different answers, so you get, yeah. get some divergence. Go ahead. Okay, so for my son's birthday back in March, went up to take him out for dinner, he goes to SUNY Albany, and there's a professor there, David Smith, that teaches the, the honors finance program. So I gave a lecture to his class. And I think that the question that I would ask is, do you want to go into this business and do you expect to outperform? Okay, so if you expect to be managing money and outperform, let's look at how many people over the... So no one in their right mind is going to give you money to manage until you're in your early 30s. And most of these kids are like 21. And then if you retire in your mid-70s, which no one really does, that implies a 40-year career. So you're going to have a 40-year track record. So let's look over the past 40 years and see how many people have outperformed the market. Not in each year, but for a 40-year period, how many have outperformed. So maybe it's a dozen, 100, 200. And then you can't count all the people that just bought Berkshire stock because that's just Warren Buffett and they're just copying. So I, I don't know if it's 100 or 200 people. Then you look at the denominator and like there are 22,000 active portfolio managers in the United States now. And then you think about the analysts that are under them and then all the people that are on Wall Street that want to be analysts and portfolio managers – you could be talking about a million people. So 100 over a million, that's not great odds. Now look forward over the next 40 years if you're starting out. So do you think the market is going to be more efficient in the next 40 years than in the previous 40 years? I mean, everybody has so their own answer. my answer is slightly different. It's a huge employment base on Wall Street. There's a lot of money still being managed actively. You're going to meet the smartest people you've ever met. You're going to be challenged in ways you've never imagined. You're going to get to meet CEOs and marketing people. You're going to see companies evolve. It's the coolest place. If you're smart and you want to work hard, it is an awesome place to work. So if the, if the idea is that only the people that outperform for 40 years are allowed to play, I think Paul's right. If you're allowed to go and have a maybe slightly above normal salary in a business that you're going to be challenged in ways you never imagined, it's the coolest career. Yeah, but if you go with the expectation of outperforming the market, you're going to. So I think Paul's uh, right, and my answer is that on the we're jacket gonna, sort of to, reality. to walk away from what is a really cool career that they're going to employ a fair number of people over the next twenty or thirty years. You have a great career. I think that you should be attracted, but I do think you should only go in the business if you absolutely love it, because. You know, Paul and I, we've both been in this business forever. And we're not actively managing money anymore. We've changed our role a bit. But well, I think, I'm still a company, Yeah, you, yeah you, he manages money. He works in the business, but he's not a hedge fund manager anymore. But we think about this all the time. I mean, I read about it. We're always talking. We talk every day on the phone. These are the people in the business. You think about it a lot. You've been in the business a long time. You're thinking about it a lot. When you read articles, your mind is that way. Don't go into the business unless you have that passion. All right. It's time to turn to some closing questions. I don't know how to do this with two people, so why don't one of you jump in on each one. What is your favorite sports moment? My favorite sports moment was in the mid-'80s, and it was the – so so the Islanders and the Rangers, for people that grew up in New York, they used to have this incredible rivalry, and the Islanders were actually a good team. So it was the fifth Islander-Ranger game in the series. 
There were 30 seconds to go in the game, and the Islanders were down, and then Dennis Potvin, like, tipped the puck in, and then they went into overtime, and the crowd just exploded. Like, I couldn't hear the whole day afterwards, and then they wound up winning in overtime. What information periodical do you read that you find helpful that other people might not know about? I can begin. When you read the Wall Street Journal and you read an article that you know a lot about, you just you're, you follow the industry, you, you grew up in that business, your parents, whatever it is, you just know a lot. And you read the article and you're about halfway through, not even a third of the way through, you cringe because they say something and you're like, well, sort of true, but not really. Then you get halfway through and you're like, ah, oh, all right, I, fair point, but. And then by the end, you're just frustrated and you're like, some points were good, some points were just dead wrong. And then you read the next article about something that you know nothing about. At the end, you say, that's interesting. So as a rule, which shocks people, I stop reading newspapers. And what I do is I use all that time to read books. I want to learn to think rather than read the news. Now, I, you know, I read the headlines and I'm well aware and you can't be in the business and not be. But I, any, alloc- any time allocation, I'd rather read books. And I read books all over the map. I'm a, a Munger fan that way. I do think you need to know multidiscipline. You should know some engineering, some psychology, some sociology, some finance, some economics. Some literature, just because I want to, I want to have a diverse pattern of, of synapse in my brain. I read journal papers most of the time now. Like, like I'd say that I probably read like a few hundred jur- journal papers a year, and there aren't, uh, like, like there aren't very many good finance books that come come out. So I haven't read a finance book in years. Are these finance journals that you're reading? No, no. Finance journals, it's... it's yeah, we think academic uh, finance is yeah, bad, a- but that's another podcast. Is, <laughs> it, the, the, the selection by... There, there, and, and then the p-hacking. Oh, it's, it's just a mess. And it's, 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 it's a mess. So wrong. it's mainly journals of you know, medical, psych- psychology, cognitive science. Paul's very interested in human behavior, particularly the collective, as, which would make sense. All right, last question. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? The one that I just keep coming back to, and that is the key to financial success is spending, not not making. The people who get into trouble, are the spend, they, they don't control their spending. One of the things I talk to my students about at the end is we've, we spent a whole course, and I keep pounding away, you would never buy anything in the stock market you didn't think was worth more. Either had an implied return that was better than the risk, or that it was mispriced. You never would. And yet you spent money all the time on things that don't deliver more value than it costs you to get the money in. So if I had known and, and really understood it, it's hard to understand. One thing know it is don't spend, be careful of spending money. The, the key to success really is, I think financial success is watching the spending more. So the other side will take care of itself over time and not getting yourself the, this American dream that I have to have vacations and baubles and art and big pools and stuff. And I think debt, uh, something I often talk about, Visa, credit cards charge 24%. You know, if you could be on the other side of that trade, you would every day. So why be on this side of the trade? I just, I, that I would pound away and watch the spending and watch credit card debt. It's just money is not going to make you happy. So just find something that you really are passionate about and love doing and then just try and figure out how to make a reasonable living so like just try and be happy with what you got guys thanks so much oh, this is great really thank enjoyed you. it thank you thank you thanks for listening to this episode i hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life if you've liked what you've heard please write a review on itunes or google play to help others find out about the show have a good one and see you next time 